In the last few years at our home, my, my family, I have taken over preparing and cooking most of the meals. Now, that does not mean I am a good cook. That is more based because Beth's work schedule is so busy, and so I had to take over more of the cooking. And I will be honest, uh, I think this is a source of great pride. In the last three years that I've been doing this, my family has not received food poisoning. Uh, so it's important to set your bar pretty low. So that's my bar, and so I'm sticking with it. But I have come a long way in my ability to cook and prepare food. Uh, early on, when we first moved to Colorado, the boys, Jacob and Noah, were in elementary school. And uh, Beth was gone for a weekend, and I had to cook a meal. And so I went to the refrigerator, and I saw what we had available, and I saw that we had sausages. But at the time, the boys really liked to have sausages in a bun. Uh, with ketchup and mustard and that kind of thing. But the problem was, we were out of buns. And so I did what all great master chefs do, seeing that there weren't buns, what do you do? You make a what? Substitution, you substitute, right? And so I looked to find a substitute for sausage buns, and I found what I thought was a perfect substitute, tortillas. <laughs> but, I decided with my culinary expertise that not only was I going to use tortillas, I was going to create a brand new dish using these tortillas and sausages. I was going to make German tacos. Yes, yes, the ultimate mashup, Mexico and Germany coming together. So what I did was I cooked the sausages, got out the tortillas, I grilled up some onions, chopped up tomatoes, put it all together, and then I topped it with salsa, of course. And I, I remember I got it all together. I had the boys come in. Remember, they're both in elementary school at the time. I put it out in front of them, and I said, here you go. And I remember, I don't know if it was Noah or Jacob at the time. Maybe it was both in unison. They looked, and they said that thing that every master chef longs to hear. They said, Dad... Do we really have to eat that? <laughs> and then one of them, I'm pretty sure, again, I can't remember who, and it's probably best that I don't. They said, Dad, that's the most disgusting thing I have ever seen. And I, of course, I encourage them, you should try it. It's going to be good. You know, never before have such culinary tastes come together into one. And so I remember they both took a bite and someone responded with, Dad, it doesn't just look disgusting, it tastes disgusting. And you know what? They were right. And I really believe it was because we were out of sauerkraut. That was the problem. But <laughs> German tacos were a fail at our house, and I ended up eating all the German tacos because I couldn't just let them go to waste, and I think the boys ended up with a grilled cheese sandwich that night or something. Now, I share that story with you uh, partly because next Sunday we have a church potluck, and I just want to assure you German tacos will not be served. Uh, but I share it with you because substitutions. If you've ever tried to make a substitution of something, the question is, is it as good as what it's substituting for? Is a substitute ever as good as the real thing? And we bring this up today not just because... We want to talk about food substitutions, but we're going to see in the next three chapters, Genesis 42 through 44, we're going to see a person serving as a substitute for someone else. And we're going to find out, did that substitution work? Did it work for a person to substitute himself for someone else? Or was it like the German tacos? So we're going to explore that today, but right now I want you to turn to someone, make eye contact with someone, look at someone across the pew, someone next to you, and just say, hey neighbor, I don't know if you've ever had a German taco, but our question today, is a substitute as good as the real thing? All right, let's get into it. And we're going to start again with Genesis 42. 
and we're going to look at the first couple verses that we just read. But here's the thing. Let's kind of backtrack a little bit. Joseph at this point, he's no longer a slave. He's no longer in jail. Is he an important guy in Egypt right now? Yes, he's very important. We talked about, you know, he could be considered maybe the prime minister or the secretary of state. He has great power. And we know that for seven years, remember Pharaoh had these dreams that God helped Joseph interpret. For seven years in Egypt, as Joseph's in charge, it was great, right? Thumbs up, prosperity. Things just grew. You throw the seeds in the ground, you didn't have to do anything, and you got this great crop. And so for those seven years, what's Joseph been doing? He's been collecting a fifth of everyone's harvest of grain and storing it up, right? We don't know exactly what kind of system he had to store it, but it must have been huge. So he's got all this grain. Well, that was seven good years, but if you remember Pharaoh's dreams and the interpretation, is it all going to be good for the rest of the time? No, because seven good years were followed by what? Seven bad years. And this was a famine. And during this time, nothing grew. But because Joseph had saved up all this grain, which again was God guiding Joseph to do so, that Egypt has an abundance of food. Well, now we are in year two of the famine. So Joseph now has been an important guy, an in charge, in command guy in Egypt for now nine years. But year two of the famine, it's not just Egypt that's experiencing this famine, it's all the lands throughout. And of those lands is Canaan. And Canaan is where Jacob and Joseph's brothers live. And so we look at the first couple verses and we see that this famine is affecting them. They're out of food. They are going to starve. And so Jacob says, I've heard, probably he saw it, you know, online somewhere. I've heard that Egypt's got food. I've heard there's grain and you can go and buy the grain. So what does he do? He tells his sons, his brothers, Joseph's brothers, you got to go to Egypt. Right now, if you look at those two verses, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Is this a pretty desperate situation right now? Yes. If we don't get food, we're going to die. So they head down there. But you'll notice if you skip down to verse 4, is it all of Joseph's brothers who go? No. Which brother has to stay behind? Benjamin. Now, this is important to note. Now, if you know the story, you're like, yeah, I remember that. Or if it's the first time, Benjamin is important because Joseph was Jacob's favorite child. And the, one of the reasons he was Jacob's favorite child is, remember, Jacob had multiple wives. But his favorite wife, again, men, do not have a favorite wife unless it's your only wife. <laughs> Joseph was the son of the favorite wife, Rachel. But Rachel had two sons. Joseph was the older son, and then the younger son was Benjamin. So Benjamin is Joseph's full brother. The other brothers are half-brothers, because they have different moms, but Benjamin is the full brother. So as soon as Joseph is gone, because remember, Jacob thinks Joseph is dead, he has chosen a new favorite. And you're like, really, Jacob? You didn't learn from the last time? Now, we don't know if he gave him a fancy coat, too, but is he protecting Benjamin right here? Absolutely. Everybody else can go but Benjamin. Why? He's the favorite. So, do the other brothers know Benjamin's the favorite? Of course they do. And so Benjamin has to stay there, but the other brothers go. And they go into Egypt, and they go to the guy who's in charge of all the food. The guy that you have to buy the food from. Now, they call him the governor of the land. He's a very important and powerful guy. Now, if we go to verse 6, now, who's the governor of the land? Joseph. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they, what? Bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Does that sound familiar? Kind of like a dream that Joseph had about 20 years before this. Remember the dreams that his brothers did not want to hear about basically them bowing down to him. And now, is it happening? Yes, they are bowing down to him. But if you look at verse 8, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. He knows who they are, but they have no idea 
This is their brother Joseph. Remember, they haven't seen him in 20 years. Now, you might say, how can Joseph recognize them, but they don't recognize Joseph? And that is such an easy question that scholars have a very simple answer for. It's because Joseph walked like an Egyptian. <laughs> no, after 20 years in Egypt, Joseph had taken on this whole Egyptian identity. He dressed differently. And again, he's dressing like a pharaoh. He's dressing like a person of great importance. They're probably still in their normal shepherd gear, so they don't recognize him. And also, were they looking for him? No. They thought he was long gone, maybe dead. They sold him 20 years ago as a slave. And so he recognizes them. And Joseph kind of messes with them a little bit. If you go to verse 11, we are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not what? Spies, because this is what Joseph is accusing them of. Four times, he's going to accuse them of being spies, of being dishonest. And isn't it a little bit ironic that their response is, we are honest men? And who are they telling it to? The guy that they threw in a pit and wanted to kill and then sold him? I'm sure he's like, yeah, real honest. Mm -hmm. But he's accusing them because he wants to learn a little more. And so what does Joseph do after this? Well, he treats them a bit harshly. If you look at verse 17, he throws them into jail. He puts them in jail for three days. And originally his plan is they're all but one are going to have to stay in jail. And the one can go back and tell the dad that you need to bring Benjamin over here because that's going to be his proof that they're not spying, not lying, that they got to bring their youngest brother. But then he decides, you know what? One of you can stay in jail and the rest can go back. And, but if you want to get this brother out of jail, which is Simeon, or you want to buy more grain, you're going to have to bring Benjamin. Which brings us to the question, why is Joseph messing with his brothers? Why doesn't he just from the very beginning say, it's me, Joseph? Why is he messing with them? And there's multiple theories on this. One theory is, Joseph, he's mad. And he's a bit conflicted inside, right? He, he wants to do the right things, but at the same time, these are the guys who wanted to kill him, who sold him as a slave. So perhaps he's struggling a little bit with these inner emotions. Another theory is that Joseph kind of messes with them because he wants to find out what's happened with his father and with his brother Benjamin. He wants to get the information. He wants to know, is Jacob still alive? Is my father still living? And a way for him to do that is kind of accusing them of being spies because they start divulging all kinds of information. These brothers would be the worst secret agents in the world. They just give up information without really much questioning. Another theory is perhaps Joseph wants to know if his brother's hearts have changed. Again, these are the same guys who wanted to kill him. He wants to know, are they still the same? Do they have more grace and compassion than they did 20 years ago? And perhaps that's why he treats them so harshly. And then another theory that scholars have thrown around is perhaps Joseph wants to find out if Benjamin's okay. Because if Benjamin's the new favorite, maybe Joseph's a little bit worried. Will these brothers do the same thing to him that they did to me? Whatever the reason, Joseph messes with these brothers. But if you go to verse 21, there's something very revealing that the brothers are saying. And remember, the brothers don't know that Joseph speaks Hebrew because he's talking to them through an interpreter. They have no idea he understands what they're saying. But look at verse 21. After all the harshness and the punishments and the accusations, the brothers said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our what? Brother, we saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Have the brothers forgotten about Joseph? No. And they are feeling guilty at this point, and they're thinking this is how it works, right? We sometimes would use the term karma, right? You get what you get when you treat other people like that. 
And that's what they're thinking. Or in their case, they're thinking God's law, right? We hurt our brother, and now we are receiving punishment. But remember, again, Joseph understands all this. He hears it. He knows what they're talking about. And he hears them talking. In verse 24, Joseph is so emotional that he has to leave so that he can cry. Because he hears his brothers remembering that whole horrible day, probably the worst day of Joseph's life, probably even worse than getting thrown in prison, being falsely accused, was when his brothers turned against him. So he's crying, but he composes himself, and he tells the brothers, you go, but I'm keeping Simeon, right, one of the brothers, which if you know the stories and the history, Simeon's a good choice to keep in jail. I'm going to keep Simeon, until you bring Benjamin back. And then he sends them on their way. He gives them their grain, and he sends them on their way. Unbeknownst to the brothers, what does Joseph do? If you look at verses 25 through 26, he has his helper, his steward, put their money, their silver coins, back into the grain bags because he doesn't want their money. Ultimately, Joseph wants to help his family. And so he sends it back, and of course, they discover it, along the way, once they get back. And when they tell Jacob what's happened, when they get back, and remember, this isn't a short trip. Canaan to Egypt, depending on the route, is anywhere between 150 to 200 miles. And they're traveling by donkey, not exactly the fastest transport in the world. So this is taking weeks to get back home. They get back home, they open up the grain, they see it, they tell Jacob that they met this governor of the land, he treated them harshly, he accused them of being spies, and he's keeping Simeon in jail until we come back. Oh, and by the way, Dad, you know how you didn't want Benjamin to go? We need to bring him back if you want to get Simeon or if you want more food. Now just imagine Jacob. What? What? Right? And then Jacob responds. If you go to verse 36, he responds to all this information, and look what he says. Their father Jacob said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Well, who's he accusing there? He's accusing the brothers, which is pretty accurate if you think about it. They are the root of all this. And Jacob is just a mess. And so Reuben, remember, of the 12 brothers, where's Reuben in the line? He's number one. He's the oldest. But he's fallen out of dad's grace because he slept with dad's concubine. Not a good move. Reuben hears his father's distress. And what does Reuben say? Go to verse 37. This might be one of the worst guarantees in the history of the world. Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him, Benjamin, back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. So what's the promise Reuben just made? He's saying, you let us, Dad, take Benjamin back, and I promise if anything happens to Benjamin, what can you do? You can kill my sons, Jacob's grandchildren. Do you think that's what Jacob wants to do? Do you think he says, you know what, that is a good plan, Reuben? No, he doesn't want to kill his grandchildren. That is the worst promise ever. And so Jacob says, no, you're not going back. Not happening. But if you know the story, now we're going to move to the next chapter. If you know the story, do they get hungry again? Yes. And they're going to need more food. And so... Jacob Jacob is going to reluctantly agree to have his brothers, Joseph's brothers, go back. But remember, in order for them to go back, who do they have to bring? Benjamin. And Jacob doesn't want to do this. And he certainly isn't going to let Reuben guarantee that with that terrible promise. But then another son of Jacob, Judah, comes forward. And if you go to chapter 43, verses 8 through 9, Judah is going to make a promise to Jacob. Again, chapter 43, verses 8 through 9. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, 
Send the boy along with me, and I will go at once, so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him if I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you. I will bear the blame before you all my life. Now, is that promise a little different than Reuben's? Yeah, he's not giving up his kids. He's saying, it'll be on me. Basically, what is Judah saying? I will be the substitute. I will take the burden. I will take that. And he must have said this with some sincerity because Jacob agrees. And he agrees to let Benjamin go with the rest of the brothers back to Egypt. And so they go back to Egypt, and we're going to move now to chapter 44. I told you, we're going to do three chapters today. This is a record. All right? They go back to Egypt, and who do they have to go to again? The guy in charge, Joseph. Again, the brothers still don't know. But this time, Joseph Stewart, his helper, says... Hey, the guy in charge, the governor, the one who accused you of being spies, the one who put Simeon in jail, he wants to invite you over for a barbecue at his house. The brothers are probably thinking, this is not good. But they don't really have a choice, so they go to his house, and there Simeon is brought out of jail. He's restored back to the brothers. And before they even meet the governor of the land, they have assigned seats at the table. And what's really wild is... This guy, who they think doesn't really know anything about them, has them assigned in birth order. That should have raised a flag, but they're thinking, okay, this is a powerful guy. He just knows things. And so they have their dinner, and lo and behold, when it's served, Benjamin gets five times as much as the other brothers. So Benjamin had a very good meal that night. They eat and eat and eat, and they drink and drink and drink, and it's quite quite a feast. Well, it ends the next day. They get their grain. They head back. And they're just a few miles from Egypt. Or perhaps they're still in Egypt, a few miles from Joseph's house. When Joseph's steward comes chasing after them, riding after them, and he makes an accusation. Because he says, one of you has stolen my master's silver cup, his special silver cup. And we know from verse 2, no one stole it because this is all part of Joseph's plan, right? The steward actually put it into a sack of one of, one of the brother's grain. And so the brothers, though, when they hear this, they're like, no way, no way. Like, look at verses 44, 8 through 9. They're saying, it can't be us. And they even make a promise If whoever stole it, you can put him to death and we'll all become your slaves. They're convinced none of us would steal your your special cup, the master's special cup. So they come back, they start opening the sacks, right? They start with Reuben and they're going, each brother opening a sack. And you can just see the brothers, right? They're just going, yeah, see, we're we're innocent, we're innocent. innocent." And they get to the last sack. And who does the last sack belong to? Benjamin. And they open the sack and what's inside? The silver cup. The silver cup. Now, Benjamin didn't steal it, but this was all part of Joseph's plan. And there it is, which means Benjamin has to become Joseph's slave. He has to be the slave to the governor of the land for the rest of his life. That was the, that's the punishment. And then Judah steps forward. Go to 44, verse 33. Now then, this is Judah talking, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. What is Judah saying? I, I will take the punishment. Remember the promise he made to Jacob. He's saying, I'm going to fulfill this. I will take the blame. I will take it. Let him go. I will be your slave. Let him leave I will take the consequence. Now, if you know a little bit about Judah, was Judah a good guy for most of this story? If you go way back when Joseph was grabbed by his brothers and they want to kill him, 
Which brother has the idea, hey, you know what? We should make some money off this guy and sell him as a slave. Which brother was that? Judah. Judah. Judah, who we see in chapter 38, who has some pretty questionable things with his sons, and especially his daughter-in-law, Tamar. If you know that story, that's one you don't usually get to hear in Sunday school. Because Judah, making bad choice after bad choice after bad choice, wants to sleep with a prostitute. And the prostitute is actually his daughter-in-law in disguise, which she becomes pregnant in order to continue the family line. It's just bad decision after bad decision. That's the same Judah. This is not a good dude. But yet here he is saying, I will take the blame. I will be the substitute. I will take the punishment. Now, you don't know the end of this story. You're going to have to wait till next week. Because next week we're going to try to wrap this thing up. So we're going to end right there with Judah's offer. Judah offering to be the substitute for the punishment of Benjamin. And we'll find out what Joseph thinks about all that. But this is not the only time in Scripture where we're going to see a substitute standing up and coming forward and saying, I'm willing to take the blame. In fact, all of Scripture from the beginning of Genesis has been pointing to a substitute, to a person who is going to be the substitute not just for one brother, but for all people. And we see Scripture pointing to it. If we go a little bit further in, go a few hundred years past Joseph and his brothers, you go to the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. If you go to Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 5, you will see Isaiah make a prediction, a prophecy, about what is to come, about a future substitute. And what is that prophecy prediction? Again, Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Go to verse 5. Because, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are what? Healed. Now, Isaiah is making that prophecy, and then jump forward hundreds of years later, the one Isaiah is prophesying about, predicting, will be on the earth, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, and he will be pierced for our transgressions. He will be put on a Roman cross, nails driven through his body. He will give up his life. He will bleed out, suffocate on a cross outside of Jerusalem. Why? Because he's taking the punishment. He said, I will take the punishment. Because we know from scripture, the book of Romans says, the wages of sin is what? Death. And Jesus said, I will take the punishment for all those sins. I will take the punishment for all the failures and mistakes that we have made, that people have made since Joseph's family and beyond. I will be the substitute. In theological terms, sometimes it's referred to as substitutionary atonement. That Jesus is taking our place and paying the price that we we're supposed to pay. He is the ultimate substitute. He is the substitute that all of Scripture has been pointing to. The one who will take our place by taking our sins upon himself to give us forgiveness, salvation, and the promise of eternal life. That is the substitution of all time. And here's the Here's the thing. We've talked about this before. The Bible is all connected. If you ever doubt the validity of Scripture, look at the connections. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all connected, which is only possible because God is the author. The Holy Spirit is empowering, inspiring people to write this. 
over the course of hundreds of years, all connected. Because if you know a little bit about the lineage of Jesus, which tribe of Israel, remember the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes are based on the sons of Jacob and also the sons of Joseph. Which tribe does Jesus come out of? The tribe of Judah. Do you see the connection? Way back in Genesis, a brother as messed up as Judah stepped forward and said, I will be the substitute for Benjamin. I will take the punishment. I will take the pain. And then hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, a perfect savior, a descendant of Judah, says, I will take the punishment for them. I will die for them because I love them, because I'm willing to give my life for you and for me. He is the ultimate substitute. He's the one that all scripture has been getting ready for. He was the plan from the very beginning of creation. And he took our place. He took our sins upon that cross. I want to finish today by showing you a small clip. It's from two of my favorite uh, skit people, uh, the, the skit guys, Tommy and Eddie, if you know them. Uh, they come out of actually Oklahoma. They've been doing this for years and years. And this clip is an oldie but a goodie. It's called The Birdcage. And I think it gives us a nice illustration of what it means that Jesus was willing to take our place, what he was willing to give for you and for me. So let's go ahead and watch that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Excuse me, son. Yeah? What have you got there? Got, got some birds, some wild birds. Really? Yeah. Where'd you get them? I'm in the field over there. There's a field with wild birds. Huh. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind my asking, what are you going to do with them? I want to play games with them. Games? Yeah, I can play games with wild birds, yeah. What kind of games? Um, sometimes I like to put a stick in there, you know, and they'll be like, gah, 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 like that, you know? And then sometimes I like to rattle to the cage, and they think it's an earthquake, and they love that. What happens to them after you're done playing games with them? Mm, usually I feed them my cat. Yeah, my cat likes wild birds. i tell you what. I am fond of wild birds. You are? Yeah. Let me buy them from you. You want to buy my wild birds? Yeah. Well, they're no good for nothing. They can't do no tricks or nothing. And when you open this gate, they're just going to fly away. How much? You're serious? I'm very serious. Five dollars. All right. Ten dollars. Okay. Twenty dollars. Th they're wild birds. They're exotic birds. You found them in a field. An exotic field. All right, that's all I got. I see you looking at the cage. Yeah. What do you got in there? You know what's in there. Mankind. Found them in the garden. The funny thing is, they put themselves in that cage. I had nothing to do with it. So what's your plans with them? I'm gonna play games with them. Games? What kind of games? All kinds of games. I'm gonna put games into their life that they think is gonna bring them so much pleasure that I'm gonna turn the world upside down. I'm going to make right seem wrong and wrong seem right. And then? They'll be damned for all eternity. My father and I, we're very fond of mankind. I know. We want them to have access to us. So, I'm going to pay for their freedom. You want these humans? Yeah. You know they've promised you everything before. They're going to turn their backs on you. 
Some will, and some won't. You're serious. Oh, I'm very serious. It'll cost you your tears. I know. Your blood. Yeah. It'll cost you your life. I know. You're willing to give your life. I'm willing to give what it takes. This reminds us about what Jesus did for us on the cross. He picked up that wooden cross and carried it to Mount Calvary because he loved you and me.